أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى عليه وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته dear sisters Alhamdulillah it is an honor to be with all of you um, Dr. Rania obviously cannot uh, be here today so inshallah we will be doing uh, we'll start off with a dhikr portion which you know and then we will read surah al-mulk inshallah and i'll give um some commentary on uh the content of character the hadith book that i began if you recall during the summer and we'll just continue from where we left off and then inshallah we'll break for aisha at eight o'clock and then after aisha um qari amr today we'll be reading du'a and nasiri so it'll be really great for everybody who can stay to participate and read with him. But if you have um, children in the teen program, they do ask that you please go pick up your kids, not to delay that, um, but please uh, feel free to stay for uh, Qari Amr's um, Dua and Nasir, inshallah. So we'll begin with dhikr, okay? Bismillah. <clears throat> and we'll do seven times of each dhikr except for the last, which is salawat, um, which we'll do ten times, inshallah. Okay? So, bismillah. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم 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 حسبي الله حسبي الله ونعم الوكيل نعم المولى ونعم النصير 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 I'm sorry, can I ask someone to please make sure that there's no mic interference or that I'm not broadcasting out there? I think they might start a program. I don't know what happened. And if someone could please close this front door too, I appreciate it. Thank you. All the way down. يا يا حي يا قيوم برحمتك نستغيث أغثنا 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 لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين 
لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين سلام قولا من رب الرحيم 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 ليس لها من دون الله كاشفة 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 اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ومولانا محمد 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 الحمد لله الحمد لله والشكر لله الحمد لله السلام عليكم again everyone welcome الحمد لله to the Rahma Foundation حلقة we will now transition to the recitation of سورة الملك shall I invite you to please grab a mushaf or if you have the uh, Quran on your phone apps but please do read along Bismillah. <laughs> الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا وهو العزيز الغفور الذي خلق سبع سماوات طباقا ما ترى في خلق الرحمن من تفاوت فارجع البصر هل ترى من فطور ثم ارجع البصر كرتين ينقلب إليك البصر خاسعا وهو حصير ولقد زين السماء الدنيا بمصابيح وجعلناها رجوما للشياطين وأعتدنا لهم عذاب السعير وللذين وللذين كفروا بربهم عذاب جهنم وبئس المصير إذا ألقوا فيها سمعوا لها شهيقا وهي تفور تكاد تميز من الغيظ 
كلما ألقي فيها فوج سأل سألهم خزنتها ألم يأتكم نظير قالوا بلى قد جاءنا نذير فكذبنا وقلنا ما نزل الله ما نزل الله من شيء إن أنتم إلا في ضلال كبير وقالوا لو كنا نسمع أو نعقل ما كنا في أصحاب السعير فاعترفوا بذنبهم فسحقا لأصحاب السعير إن الذين يخشون ربهم بالغيب لهم مغفرة وأجر كبير وأسر قولكم أو جهروا به إنه عليم بذات الصدور ألا يعلم من خلقه وهو اللطيف الخبير هو الذي جعل لكم الأرض ذلولا فامشوا في مناكبها وكلوا من رزقه وإليه النشور أأمنتم من في السماء أن يخسف بكم الأرض فإذا هي تمور أم أمنتم من في السماء أن يرسل عليكم حاصبا فستعلمون كيف نذير ولقد كذب الذين من قبلهم فكيف كان نكير أولم يروا إلى الطير فوقهم صافات ويقبض ما يمسكهن إلا الرحمن إنه بكل شيء بصير أم من هذا الذي هو جند لكم ينصركم من دون الرحمن إن الكافرون إلا في غرور Is there someone here? Give a talk, but thank you. We'll just wait. This translation of a very important work, which is called Merits of the Play, written by a very important figure in Islamic intellectual history, Ibn Hajar al Asqalani. Um, and um, let me kind of give you some background information before I get into this specific talk, which looks at a specific issue of how does this 15th century uh, Muslim intellectual Ibn um, Hajar. Okay, Alhamdulillah, I think they did it. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khairan, thank you. بسم الله أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم أمن هذا الذي هو جند لكم ينصركم من دون الرحمن إن الكافرون إلا في غرور أمن هذا الذي يرزقكم إن أمسك رزقه بل لجوا في عتو ونفور أفمن يمشي مكبا على وجهه أهدا أم من يمشي سويا على صراط مستقيم قل هو الذي أنشأكم وجعل لكم السمع والأبصار والأفئدة قليلا ما تشكرون قل هو الذي ذرأكم في الأرض وإليه تحشرون ويقولون متى هذا الوعد إن كنتم صادقين قل إنما العلم عند الله وإنما أنا نذير مبين 
فلما رأوه زلفة زلفة سيئت وجوه الذين كفروا وقيل هذا الذي كنتم به تدعون قل أرأيتم إن أهلكني الله ومن معي أو رحمنا فمن يجير الكافرين من عذاب أليم قل هو الرحمن آمنا به وعليه توكلنا فستعلمون من هو في ضلال مبين قل أرأيتم إن أصبح ما أكم غورا فمن يأتيكم بما إمعين صدق الله العظيم الحمد لله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أجن السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله how is everyone it's a difficult question to ask right these days I don't know myself how to answer that question I'm like I don't know I don't know how to formulate um, an accurate response that conveys what I'm feeling, what I'm thinking. It's it's a very difficult time for our ummah. And many of us um, may be struggling, you know, not only in our personal lives, but obviously with everything that's happening uh, in the world and this just sense of like, when will this nightmare be over? You know, it's kind of like being in a dream or in a nightmare and just wishing that you can wake up out of it. But this is dunya. And I think it's really important that we maintain that perspective that this is, you know, for the believers, this is a prison and prisons are not comfortable. Prisons are constricting spaces. They're confining spaces. They're spaces that you really don't know any minute or any day what what's uh, what's going to happen because you're not in power, you're disempowered. So we have to accept that that is the abode, that, the nature of the abode that we're in. And we are told, the Prophet told us that, you know, in the latter days that there were going to be this this immense fitna that we're seeing and, and upheaval of, of killing and tribulation and a lot of, you know, natural disasters and just so many things that, um, that we have to just uh, accept as, we are part of the latter days, and this is the test of our ummah. We're tested in this world, inshallah. Allah will spare us in the next, and we will be in his divine mercy and grace and shade in the next life for all the challenges and tribulations that our ummah experiences in this world. So those are the consolations, but it's still difficult. But uh, as we're reminded over and over again by our teachers, we have to keep going. We can't wallow in sadness and despair and start to feel like we're withering away because we don't have, you know, any idea of what's what's happening, and we feel this sense of displacement and and like you know the the just feeling disempowered. We can't let that. We can't succumb to those feelings, right? We have to keep going. So that means we have to continue taking care of our responsibilities, our children, our spouses, our parents, our community. And mashallah, it's really beautiful to see all of you here. Um, and another thing that I feel like I've realized is um, we need to be with each other, right? This is the time where our Oma really needs to feel the power of sisterhood and brotherhood of the Jama coming together. So just feeling, uh, being grateful for having a masjid that we can come to, having these programs that we can benefit from. I know there's, mashallah, there's a program right now happening. There'll be the dua that's going to happen afterwards tomorrow, all weekend there's programs. So just um, leaning into our community and leaning into the need for our hearts to find that tranquility in a time where there's storms, you know, all around us. Um, but this is the hu the hub, right? The masjid is a refuge for it's a house of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And our community, we're also, um, inshallah, we can provide that for one another just by meeting each other with warmth, with love 
with, um, you know, hugs, you know, I've, I've received a lot of hugs and I'm giving hugs. So if you need a hug, feel free to bring it in afterwards. Um, but I know that sometimes that's all you need. You just need someone to give you that sense of you're not alone and inshallah, we'll make it through this. As long as we have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Hasbun Allah wa ni'mad wakil. That is really uh, what's going to carry us through this, these difficult times. Um, with that said, you know, uh, part of our um, uh, part of our medicine also is to uh, obviously partake in um, our ritual worship. Alhamdulillah, the prayer is a is a huge blessing for us. You know, just to be able to throw our hands into the air, say Allahu Akbar, and enter that beautiful, intimate conversation with Allah. He knows the burdens in our hearts. What a gift to have. You know, there are people out there who who don't have faith at all and they're witnessing all of this and they're really the ones that i i don't know how they're even managing i really don't know how Billah, you can exist in this world and this time and this place and not have faith but there are many people who are doing it and of course they're turning to other things you know that they're self-medicating they're trying to find other ways to numb their pain but we've been given this incredible gift of prayer alhamdulillah of the quran the book of allah i mean this is it right here and if we're not reading the Quran every single day, but we're trying to make sense of the insanity of the world, we are really not doing it right. We're going to not find answers. You, you can watch as much news as you can consume. You can watch horrific videos. You can try to follow all the social media hysteria around what's going on in the world. But this book of Allah is what's going to give you a sense of understanding a sense of peace that Allah is in control. I don't have to overthink and over analyze and over scrutinize. Why, 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 why that question that nags, right? The hearts of many people who don't have faith. Why, 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 why we don't have to do that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has all those answers. And he told us it will all be revealed in due time. Just focus on what you can do. Your uh, sphere of influence and your sphere of control and what we can control is making sure our homes are sound are, are places of the worship of allah that our families are intact that our children are loved that our community is is held together those are the things that we can do um, but it is beautiful to witness i don't know how many of you are seeing it's been really as a, as a silver lining uh if you can even imagine one in, in the midst of all of this um, chaos and and um, you know just violence and and everything that we're seeing in the midst of all that, Subhanallah, there has been this tremendous awakening that's happening. Assalamualaikum. Okay, Mashallah. Thank you so much. So we have news that the daycare is open now. So if any moms want to drop off their kids, they can do that now. Jazakallah khair and thank you. So um. I was saying, I don't know how many of you have know, have seen these videos that have come out. Um, they seem to be, you know, uh, more and more people are are, are turning to uh, Islam. They're actually, people are coming to learn about Islam because they're witnessing the faith of our dear brothers and sisters in Palestine, which we have to marvel at. We have to marvel at these people who are, death and destruction is around them, but they cannot utter anything else than the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah. They're actually, you know, um, in many ways, consoling us and everybody else who's witnessing what they're going through by their just incredible strength and ability to endure what's happening to them. They're reciting the book of Allah there. I mean, I've seen enough to see, mashallah, these people are people of immense faith. And so you have all these non-Muslims who, for the first time ever, right, because of the access, we've never seen, if you really think about it, I'm from, uh, born in Afghanistan, um, I'm sure many of the people here have some, you know, backstory that leads to an area that's had conflict or even war. When did we ever get such a window into the daily experience of war than we've had in this her horrific situation, right? We've seen, we live, it's almost like we're living it, right? Although we're very, uh, we're not, we're very privileged to not be there, but we're witnessing it. And so you're seeing people for the first time ever have this level of exposure to war and the atrocities of war and the suffering of the, the grand, the, the great 
toll of, of human suffering that we've never seen before. And what they're doing is they're saying, how are these people able to withstand all of this and not lose it? Like they're not jumping off of buildings. They're not going crazy. They're not running into, you know, areas where they know they're going to die. They're still have the fight in them. They want to live, they want to survive, but then they're also, they have such incredible faith. And what are they doing? They're saying, I want to know and understand that level of faith. I've never seen that before. You know, one lady, she said it, she said, the people in Palestine are actually living the, um, the virtues that prophet Ayub, she referred to him as Job, right in the Bible, that he that we we they, the the Christians and the Jews read in the Bible's version, but it's very similar that that prophet Job or prophet Ayub suffered a lot, and she was saying that they're living it, the level of patience that he had to endure it. So she was like, I want to understand this, and so what they're doing is subhanAllah, they're ordering copies of the Quran. And then there now there's Quran book clubs all over social media. People for the first time, they're like, I never knew Islam had the answers to all these deep questions that I have had my entire life. And chapter one of the Quran, chapter two of the Quran, I'm reading it and I'm like, this is God speaking to me. And it's so beautiful because if you look at the comments of those videos, you know what they are? The comments, subhanAllah, are all of us the Muslims who have taken this faith for granted. And there you'll read comment after co comment, I'm Muslim, you're inspiring me to read the book of Allah. I haven't touched the Quran in years. And now, I, because you're, I'm looking at it through your eyes, I wanna go back and start reading the Quran. So it's like this ripple effect, SubhanAllah, Allah guides whomever he wills. The Palestinians who are literally li trying to survive war are inspiring people of zero faith to wake up to the fact that they there's more to this whole story of, of humanity than they've been told. Because, you know, if you have, I mean, if you really look at Western culture, they've managed to, and, and in my lifetime, I've seen it. I'm sure those of you who are in my generation, I've seen it in film and television. It's this slow erasure of God and religion, right? We've all seen it. There was a time um, where I remember very clearly God would be evoked, you know, like w award shows, people would just talk about God, even like around the holiday season, it was very common for people to be in a celebratory state because they were acknowledging that it's a religious holiday. Like, so Christmas was not this, it wasn't all about, you know, the secularized sort of version that it is now. It was still seen as a religious holiday. People went to church. Um, and they spoke about God, but over years now, I have seen the erasure of God. And so a lot of the people that we share this, you know, uh, country with the, the, our cities with, they have grown up in an a-religious, secular, atheist world. So their worldview has been devoid of, of God, of the importance of faith. And now because they're witnessing faith, they're moved and it's like their heart is, you know, waking up, right? Uh, because they've been in a slumber and subhanAllah, then that effect has had a ripple effect on those of us who've been given this truth, but then we take it for granted, right? We're the ones that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave this deen to, but how many of us, and if we don't take ourselves to task, we're not learning the lesson that why do we disregard our deen and look to other things. And what I mean by that is, you know, some of you may know, but one of the topics that I teach about um, and I enjoy teaching about it, and it's very purposeful, right? The topics that I try to teach on, it's purposeful because I'm witnessing that our community needs to find, and myself included, we need to value our deen more, but sometimes the way we get to that conclusion we kind of have to go in a different direction. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, I teach about emotional intelligence, right? How many of you know about emotional intelligence? Okay, good, alhamdulillah. How many of you know um, what the five qualities are of emotional intelligence? According to, there's different people who now write about it, but the original person who really put emotional intelligence on the map, in, in the modern era anyway, his name is Daniel Goleman. And he identified five qualities of emotional intelligence. Does anybody know what they are? 
do a quick Google search. I'll give you 30 seconds. Let's see who's, who's quick fingered here. Uh, the five qualities are one is self-awareness, okay? Then self-regulation, motivation, empathy, and social skills. So these are five. It's very easy to memorize, and I encourage you to memorize it, not because of any other reason, but that it's a structured way to understand Islam. These five, is a, they all describe Islam. You have to start with self-awareness, right? We are put on the path, and the, one of the first topics or, or subjects that we are supposed to learn if we were doing this properly, we should have, anyway, learned aqidah. Like, what is the creed of a Muslim? What do you believe? What What is the basis of our belief, right? So that is the starting point of building your faith upon. You have to know what your belief is, right? Do you, we're a monotheistic belief, obviously. Um, we believe in you know, six articles of faith. That That's a pretty comprehensive list of all the things that can uh, that uh, inform our creed. So you start with that, and then you also... That's your general, you know, understanding of yourself. Like Allah Subhanahu wa Taala created you and me with a design, with a purpose to worship Him. This is very clearly stated in our faith. And then there's a more deeper understanding of yourself. So, under self-awareness, we're supposed to actually give our unique blueprint some time. Like all of us are different. We're very similar in that we we share humanity and we share cultures and languages. But at the same time, there are also unique aspects to us that if you don't give some time to, you're in a way um, denying the ni'mah of God because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did make each of us special. Like, just think about that for a, a moment. Our fingerprints are unique. Our DNA is unique, right? Um, there are physical qualities that we have that are not replicable in this room or throughout human humanity, we could take every person that's ever existed or will exist and that we won't match. So there's this uniqueness to our being, our actual being. And then in addition to that, the way that we, um, I mean, our purpose, right? We all have a, a purpose. It's also individualized, right? How many of you are here are in the medical profession? Raise your hand. Mashallah. So we have maybe nurses and doctors here. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put you on that path and not me or others, right? How many of you here are in uh, education? Okay, mashallah. There you go. How about law? How, how many, any lawyers in the room? All right, mashallah. Engineers? Alhamdulillah. Excellent. Uh, advocacy work, maybe social justice, your work in that capacity. No? Okay, I'm there. how many of you are mothers? Well, there we go, all the hands go up, mashallah. That was an obvious one. Alhamdulillah. So you see, we have these things, obviously, that we share, but then there are also these differences. And then personality. Like, personality is actually quite important to know why are you the way you are, and that yet in your same household, right? How many of us have siblings that are completely different from us? Like, we are raised by the same parents, same general rules, right? Same upbringing overall, same food, a lot of things were, were, we were given a lot of the same things, but then you come out completely different, right? Because there is a design element that you need to understand about yourself. So paying attention to all of that, learning about yourself, this is what we would call like your mizaj, right? How many of you have ever studied your own temperament? Okay. It's really important area of study. Um, in fact, if you're a mom, inshallah, I think most of the people here are, or maybe will be very soon. Temperament is something that is required uh, for you to know, first and foremost of yourself, but also for your children. Imam al-Ghazali actually believed that a person who has not studied temperament should never be, should not be with children. Like they shouldn't be around children. So if you're teaching or if you're a mother and you haven't studied temperament, go study temperament. Because that is a, an area, it's a wealth of information. It'll open up so much uh, your eyes to your own self. Uh, why are some people um, reactionary and other people aren't, right? If you're a reactionary person, that means you you have a hard time maybe, um, you know, practicing restraint, right? You're, you're quick to respond to things. You maybe are a little too 
you know, uh, quick, especially if it comes to confrontational situations, maybe you're the person that fires back really fast, you know, and I know some of us are in here, we're like that, you know, nobody can get away with it. We have to have the last word, right? Uh, and if that's your nature, you're going to have some challenges if you're with someone or if you have relationships with someone who is the complete opposite, right? And this is why you see a lot of times, subhanAllah, people are paired with completely different temperaments. Like I'll I'm very uh, obvious uh, example myself. I am um, what we would call a, maybe an ambivert now as I'm getting older, much more leaning towards introversion. But yeah, my whole life always been an extrovert. My spouse is one of the most introverted people ever. Like, <laughs> so how does that happen that I... But I've always found that that was a natural pairing for me, maybe because I'm just too much energy. So I'm like, I need someone to bring it down, you know, calm me down a little bit and vice versa, because I think people who are introverted actually like the high energy of, you know, capacity or output of an extrovert person. So you see these pairings a lot, but this is all important, relevant information because think about, and I mentioned this because I, I did a, I was in Texas this past weekend. So I, I did a talk on this topic of emotional intelligence, but I really think we don't take it as seriously as we should. If you think about what emotional intelligence is, by the way, I'm sorry, I didn't define it. It's managing, no, identifying your own emotions and managing your emotions and then managing other emotions. That is the quick definition of emotional intelligence. If you have emotional intelligence, you can say, I am frustrated, which is very different than I am angry right? If you can't differentiate between anger and frustration, that means you haven't done enough work on identifying emotions. So you need to spend a little bit of time like knowing emotions and how they uh, play out because there's primary and secondary. So anyway, but that's one of the qualities and then managing other people. So I was saying that if you think about our uh, existence, I would say, I don't know, like I'm just throwing out a number, but like 95% of our waking hours, I think is doing one or the other. You're either trying to manage your own self and your own emotions, right? Or you're managing other people. And especially for those of us that are wives and mothers, there's a lot of emotional management. And I think that's probably where we are all depleted because we're constantly expected to fix this person's problem and you know help this person and, and do this and that. So this just this giving, 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 but then where is our cup being filled, right? So that is where really paying attention to your um your your personality your temperament your needs as a human being will make you more aware of where you need to you know what you need to cultivate more for yourself maybe some areas where you are giving too much and it's not really benefiting you it all starts to become clear and a good example like i said is um you know i i just think of like female relationships how many of us by show of hands have experienced toxic friendships. This is such a common problem among women. And I know because I have a lot of people come to me. I, I just, today, subhanAllah, read a question from, it's because you know I, I work with uh, middle school students and college students. So I usually do anonymous Q and A. And so I had, I just read it because I was looking at through papers and I had this one question that said, how do you deal with really toxic friendships? This is from a middle school student. So I remember oh, middle school, I had, we had so much drama. Like, why was there so much drama at that age? It's such an innocent time, you know, but how many, uh, you know, emotions were you constantly managing? This girl's mad because you didn't invite her to this. And this girl's jealous because you like the same boy that she did. And that's all this nonsense, right? But it's like, there's so much uh, toxicity, even in that tender age of adolescence. And then for some people, it doesn't end. It actually continues well into adulthood. And so you have women who are right now, I'm, I'm sure pretty certain there's people in this room who are dealing with some toxic friendship or even relationship it could be a sibling. It could be a sister-in-law, mother-in-law, but there's like a toxic relationship, right? So if you haven't figured out, and by the way, this is good news for any of you who are in your 20s, okay? 20s are a rough ride. It's tough times. You're figuring yourself out. There's so much like, you know, you don't know. There's there's just too, too many things in life that you're still learning about. And it's tough. You're, you're expected to have answers, but you don't quite have the experience. So 20s are tough. 
30s, you start to get your bearings, right? 30s. 30s are kind of fun, right? If you remember 30s, because now you're like, I got some things figured out. But I, I'm telling you, there's nothing like the 40s. Like, right? How many of you? Tell me. I, I, I don't know. I feel like it's a very common thing. But once you get into the 40s, you're like, oh, my God, if only I could go back in time and be my 40-year-old self when I was 20. <laughs> Oh, the lessons that I have learned and the experience. And it's just, you feel so much more sure of yourself. You're not apologetic. You're like, this is, it is what it is. You just have this confidence, right? That exudes. Um, and, and it's just so, it's amazing. What a gift the forties are. No, I really, well, I, I, cause I remember my 20 and 30 year old self. And I'm like, God, if I could only go back in time, you know, I go those time machines you know, back to the future where it's like the two versions of yourself and you could write a little note <laughs> to yourself. Don't worry, you'll get through this and avoid this person and don't talk to this person. How many of us would love to do that, right? Because you waste so much time in those years trying to, you know, just find yourself. But subhanAllah, the four, and the, interestingly enough, the four, 40s is the age of prophecy, right? It's the age of wisdom. It's the age of suddenly, it's like, the veils have been lifted and you start to see what a waste of time so much of what you were putting into was. Well, guess what? Although, you know, I'm we're, we're talking about this in terms of years and experience, I think part of the problem is because we're not teaching these fundamental sciences. Like, I think if we really spent a lot of time teaching youth and young people about their temperament, their personalities, and kind of gave them the tools, right? Because Adolescence is the age of building your toolkit in life, right? And think of how many of us, and maybe it's a generational thing, but a lot of us didn't have like uh, psychological, you know, um, kits and tools or like all this pop culture stuff that, I mean, in, in, in some cases it can be beneficial, right? Self-help books, guides, there's all these, you know, videos and, and a lot of things that benefit the youth of this day. And that's why I feel like nowadays, because I work with teens, they're very mature. They have a, a lot of understanding in areas that I had no clue about when I was their age, right? So the difference is knowledge. It's not age. And I think that's a big uh, part of Western culture that maybe some of us have adopted, which is looking at youth as being like somehow, like, you know, teens, I'm speaking of teens, like their children. That's not Islamically correct. Islamically, teens are adults, right? They're badakh. So when we look at a teenager, if we see them as being, oh, immature, and yes, there's parts of their brain that hasn't fully developed and, and all of that, but they still have accountability. They're supposed to have knowledge of their fardain. Like by the time you reach the age of puberty in Islam, you're supposed to have grounded, solid knowledge that informs you how to navigate the world. You're not just supposed to be treated like a kid. But we we do the opposite. We infantilize and we dumb down our children. And then we get them started way too late on life. And, and then they're thrown into relationships they have no preparation for. So I feel like we've just, we're going so against the grain of even our own tradition. And that's why it takes so much time sometimes to come into your own. But if we were to actually do things the way that our tradition teaches us, it would be this beautiful flowering that happens of a person's, you know, uh, personality and their, their level of self-awareness that then lends itself to healthy relationships, right? I'm sorry, I see a hand here. Yes. True. Sure. Absolutely. No, you're right. The, the problem with the information age that we all live in is that the internet is just filled with so much misinformation and disinformation muddled and mixed in with accurate information. And so who knows what they're getting? And I agree with you that they have, it's information overload. So on the one hand, they're very smart. They have a lot of knowledge, but is it good sound knowledge? That's what's in, being called into question. So, you know, to your question, uh, you know, alhamdulillah, there are, you know, efforts, um, and I can maybe try to come up with some resources, but just for, for the sake of time, the topic that I'm talking about, emotional intelligence, I have presented, there are YouTube videos, and I have offered that 
to um, youth before. I actually, whenever I can get a chance, I try to teach uh, youth and young professionals because I think it's such a valuable area of study that if we, if only we, if only I had, I mean, I really say this, honestly, I wish I had that knowledge when I was younger. I think I could have prevented so much heartache, so much pain, so much time wasting because we're aimlessly trying to figure out the world and our Dean gives us guidance. But then the thing is, the Dean is, um, it's, there's so many, it's like, it's, a, it's spread out, right? You have the Quran, you have Hadith, you have to uh, take certain prerequisite knowledge in order to access other knowledge. So it becomes difficult to even know where to begin, right? Um, and that's where I think it's, for some people, it, it, they don't know where to even start. So then what they do is they just work on a career path. So Dean becomes, you know, something that you you have, you know, as an identity, and it's something that you certainly um, love and value. And it ke comes in peak times of the year, Ramadan, Hajj, there's certain times where you start to see a practice increase. But in terms of knowledge of Dean and how to organize your Dean, unless you're really on a path of scholarship or knowledge, most people are just trying to patchwork it and figure it out. You know, we read Hadith here, we have apps, we read books, we go to Halaqas, we're looking at internet, you know, different teachers that we like, ooh, this quick five minute YouTube video. It's just so all over the place. So why I think this structure of emotional intelligence is a really healthy way to introduce Dean even to youth is because it's five points and under each point is actually, um, you know, areas of study that can be condensed and consolidated and structured. So like I said, you learn Aqidah. Who, what is your belief as a Muslim? Once you've learned that and you establish that, now let's get a little bit more personal and dig into your unique, you know, mizaj, learning about the four temperaments, for example. You know, when I when I talk about temperament, it's an area of su study. It's actually a, su a subject. So if you've never studied it, there's a book called The Temperament That God Gave Me. Um, Lafay, Tim Lafay, I think is the name. It's a husband and wife. Um, I think that's his name. That's a good book. It's a Christian resource, but these are, you know, ancient uh, sciences that many uh, of the, you know, world religions talked about as well. So the Christian tradition, um, Jewish tradition, I think, also talks about temperaments and Islam. Of course, many of our scholars studied, taught, and this was something that they encouraged people to learn. Because how are you going to be in a relationship with someone, especially marriage? Like marriage is, you have to learn to manage yourself and manage your spouse's emotions, right? And if you don't even know who you are, you can't even express your needs, um, you don't understand the way that you work versus your spouse, it causes a lot of miscommunication, right? So Mizaj is one. There's other things too that you can kind of throw in there. I mean, I know there's modern temper uh, personality tests that a lot of people take, great. Whatever it is that gives you a better understanding of yourself, but that would be self-awareness. And then we go into you know, self-regulation, which is the second uh, topic. And that's a huge area of, of knowledge that could be uh, understood, you know, um, under, under the umbrella of taskiyat and nafs, right? Like, if you don't know how to control yourself, you're going to have a lot of problems. And that's a problem that we see now. There's a lot of people who are dysregulated emotionally because they've never really... Um, dug deep to even understand their own, um, their own, you know, uh, spiritual diseases. They've never figured out how to get rid of their diseases. So when you study purification of the heart, what it's teaching you is these are your, this is your jihad in this life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us that we all have our own personal struggles. And so each of us will struggle differently and you should know your spiritual diseases so that you can work on those things because that's the whole reason why you were created is to purify your heart, to worship God and to present to him on the day of judgment a heart that is sound of defect and disease. So learn, learn the disease of the heart, start working on that. So that's where self-regulation comes. And again, if you just follow the five points in this structured way, subhanAllah, you're going to have a very clear roadmap of of you know, arriving inshallah to the point that we all hope and wish to be, which is on the path of the prophetic character, right? That we're developing prophetic character. So you go from self-regulation and really learning to practice that. And then you go to motivation, which is the third point. And this is important because one of the challenges of the modern era, era is that a lot of people are 
they because they don't have strong faith, they they have a hard time, you know, staying motivated, right? But the benefit of working in this way and this structure that our dean teaches us is that the motivation will come intrinsically. You will feel more accomplished, right? And if you think about what discipline does, once you become a disciplined human being, you start to reap the benefits and the rewards of discipline, right? This can be easily like an analogy, a good analogy is exercise, right? How many of us, and I, I will tell you, when I want to start an exercise program, the biggest challenge is the first day, right? How often do we stand in our own way? Cause we're like, oh, tomorrow, I'll start tomorrow. I'll get on that treadmill, I'll go to the gym. And you keep delaying and you keep delaying and you keep delaying and then it's like months go by and you're like, this, <laughs> that machine is collecting dust, that gym membership is a waste, right? I haven't even gone. And then all of a sudden something will motivate you. Maybe it's a good friend, maybe it's your spouse, maybe you saw a video and you're like, that's it, I can't be a loser anymore and I'm gonna go and you do it. And then you do it and you're like, wow, I felt the high, right? Of like that, and it is, it's endorphins, it's all these chemicals that are your brain is producing that make you feel good. You wake up, you may be a little sore, but you feel accomplished, right? You're like, yeah, I, I ran like two miles or I walked, or if you do a hike, whatever it is, the sense of accomplishment that you feel makes you want to do it again and again and again and again. But sometimes overcoming the nafs is difficult. So that's what motivation does is it, if you pray your five days, right? And you're praying inshallah consistently because it feels good to worship Allah, to know that you're doing what you were designed to do, inshallah, you'll continue doing it. When you read Quran, right? Think of the days that you don't read Quran versus the days that you read Quran. How? What a big difference. Do you not feel better? Because you're like, I actually read the book of Allah today. I don't hate myself. I don't feel like, oh, I squandered the whole day once again. Or when you fast, you're make, made up the fast that we have to make up before Ramadan. How great do we feel? Because we're reaping the benefits of feeling accomplished and feeling like we're disciplined. So discipline is actually very important for the human being. And that's why our deen is beautiful because our entire day is structured around discipline. You have to be a disciplined, disciplined person to get yourself up out of bed four o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the morning, splash cold freezing water on your face. That requires discipline. Most people cannot even fathom that, right? When you talk to non-Muslims, they're like, what? You actually get up out of bed and you, you do this? Ramadan, you know, we all know the question. So the point is, is that is Allah subhanahu wa gives you the reward of it by the feeling that you get to want to continue doing that. And you will do it, you will feel that. And that's just a great gift from Allah. And that's a quality of being emotionally intelligent that you just have that sense of purpose and motivation. And then you, once you've done the first three and you really are working on that path, now what I love about, again, the structure is it falls very much in line with our, our deen again, because you've worked on building yourself, you're developing yourself into a good person, now what you do is you work outwardly. So the fourth quality of emotional intelligence is to be empathic, right? You cannot be a Muslim and a true believer and be narcissistic and be completely self-involved and be completely devoid of empathy for other people. It just doesn't work. There's something missing in you if you can see the suffering of another person and just walk right by it. Right. And um, earlier, uh, you know, we were with, uh, I was, I just came from Zaytuna. So Sheikh Hamza was speaking and he said, you know, it's makru to mention death like during meal time because, you know, people, if, for believers anyway, if death is mentioned, it should make you lose your appetite. Right. And it's because, you know, when we, we should have like a visceral response to tragedy, whether it involves us or not, doesn't matter. So when you're, you know, when you're desensitized to human suffering, that's a problem. And that's what we're seeing. And I know for me, with all the news that's happening, that's a big part of my um, processing is I'm really shocked at the dehumanization, right? of our people and the cold callousness that people are speaking about them. Like it's sho it's shocking to me because I'm like, how can you be so devoid of just basic human decency? Because that's what happens to human beings. Empathy 
is something you have to inculcate and we have to, it's a practice. And if you don't have it, you will turn cold like what we're seeing. You see these celebrities and these people of power and influence politicians and the way that they speak, nuke them, give them hell. And you're just like, are you serious? Like, what are you? How do you have a humanity left in you if you can speak about other people that way? But this is, you know, spiritual disease. When it when it corrodes the heart, that's what it leads to. So the the answer to that is empathy. And how do you practice empathy? Right? What's the difference between empathy and sympathy? What's what's sympathy? Sympathy is I feel sorry for you, right? I'm witnessing your pain and I'm like, oh, poor thing. So what are we doing tomorrow? There's very little uh, impact. It's like I'm witnessing it, I see it, I feel bad momentarily, but I can compartmentalize and I can move on. A lot of us, we are sympathetic, right? Empathy is very different. Empathy is, I feel sick. I feel I can't function. I ha I can't sleep. There are people right now, I know because I've had many conversations with people who are like, I'm up every hour just looking at the news. I, 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 I'm, I'm beside myself. I don't feel like I'm myself. I can't function properly. I'm at work. I'm, uh, losing, you know, train of thought. I keep thinking because your, your whole mind, heart, soul, body is suffering, right? Which is what the believers are supposed to do in times like this. We're one body, right? One part of the body hurts, the whole body hurts. So that's empathy. That's what we're supposed to have, but many people don't have it unfortunately, because we've become what? Desensitized. We've become desensitized to human suffering. We've seen too many violent movies play. They're, you know, people who can play gruesome, grotesque video games where people are being eviscerated and, you know, with swords and, and knives and, and whatever else, guns blown to pieces. Muslims, why are we participating in that sick culture? It's a sick culture to do that. Violence is not something we should, you know, romanticize or, or glorify. It's it's a sickness. It's sick to, to see bloodshed, even if it's fake and even if it's uh, an image that's on a screen, it doesn't matter because what it does to the heart is it turns the heart cold to real human suffering. And that is why there are people who walking around us who literally don't care that there are people that are that are infants, babies, grandmothers, mothers, men, innocent women, children that are being killed in, in this genocide. There are people who don't care. They've lost their humanity. So empathy is something that the Prophet of course had, and he perfected all of the virtues. You will not find a more empathic person in existence than the Prophet Everything he said, he did, the way that he treated people of all backgrounds, ages, was a... Um, you know, he was modeling empathy for us. He was showing us what it means to be empathic. But what it requires is, again, an outward focus. Because when you're inwardly focused, you're thinking about your own benefit, right? It's always about what serves you. So he taught us to look outward, outwardly. Is that the other one? Oh, subhanAllah. Okay. All right, inshallah. I you know I'm so sorry because I was supposed to read a hadith, but then I started talking. So we didn't get to the hadith. But inshallah, please feel free to go for Aisha. And then inshallah, I'm going to end the halaqa right now because afterwards you'll be joining uh, Qari Amr. So I'll, I'll, we'll just end here. Um, and inshallah, we'll continue the discussion another time. So bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصبر سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك شهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الحمد لله جزاكم الله خيرا I apologize I didn't realize the time but the last uh, quality for those who are curious is uh, social skills so the five